You wake up, and before even a drop of sunlight can touch your skin, you reach for your phone. You scroll through email, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, trying to catch up on everything that happened while you were asleep. No shame, no shame at all, because that was literally me. L literally, that was me in the video. And that's why I started using the app Forest. Forest is essentially a Pomodoro timer. And if you haven't heard of Pomodoro, one, it's a hilarious name, Pom Pomodoro, fun to say. It's a time management method that involves working in intervals of like 10 to 30 minutes. And after those 10 to 30 minutes, you take a little bit of a break. This is done to keep your mind fresh and make it seem like every project project is a realistic project that could be done in 20 to 30 minutes. This is a super effective studying method and focus method, and I've used it over the years for studying for coding interviews and learning data structures and algorithms. Blech. Now there are a ton of Pomodoro applications, but Forest has a little bit of a twist to it. Now it's called Forest because you're planting trees. Every time you finish a Pomodoro interval, successfully, you get to plant a little tree. And then at the end of the week or the year, you can look back at all the trees that you planted and you got a little forest on your hands, it's beautiful. However, I mentioned forest has a little bit of a twist to it. And the twist is that when you have a Pomodoro interval ongoing, it's gonna block you from the time-sucking applications on your phone. And unlike some other applications, if you open up the application and blow through the warning sign, it kills a tree. It kills it. I know it's a digital tree, but I don't know how they engineered this, but I just feel so sad whenever I do kill a tree. It's just, it's not fun. <laughs> and that fear of being sad for killing a tree is enough to keep me focused on whatever task I'm doing for X amount of time. So this is typically a study application, but I've been using it slightly different. So instead of waking up and just completely diving into my phone and figuring out what happened when I was asleep, I slap the forest application and it sets a 20 minute timer. Now on that 20 minute timer, I am now forced to be a human and do human things like get out of bed, drink water, bathe myself, something that I typically wouldn't do until I finish scrolling through my application. Now that's forest. And you'll notice that a lot of the productivity applications that I'm using daily revolve around this guy, the little cell phone. And that's for a reason, because productivity is defined as the ability to get as much work done in a particular amount of time. But the thing that holds most people back from getting that work done is distractions. And where do distractions come from? Kids, no, not kids. Usually, typically, your cell phone. I'm willing to bet that this thing right here is the number one distractor for most adults probably even kids too. The average person spends about seven hours a day on internet connected devices and 41% of adults say they have trouble managing their screen time. And I was the same exact way until I actually started to pay attention and manage my screen time. And once I started to track my screen time, the stats that I saw of how much time I was pouring into my phone was disgusting, goodness. I used to say, oh, I don't have time for that or gee willikers, where did the time go? And then I would look at my phone and there'd be like 10 hours of TikTok on there. And as a self-taught software engineer, content creator, avid world traveler, and self-proclaimed family man, I'm realizing that every second counts. I gotta use it wisely, which is why screen time is on my list. Kind of. In iOS, it's not really an application, it's baked into the operating system. So both Android and iPhone have their own versions of screen time. I'm using an iPhone, so I'm gonna talk about the features that are on the iPhone, but they're gonna be pretty similar whether you're on an Apple or an Android. Potato. So in iOS, you can get a rich view of insights and analytics into your screen time. You can view your screen time on a daily basis or even by a weekly basis. And you can even go further than that. You can get a bird's eye view into what type of applications you're using, whether it be social media, productivity, finance, or utilities. Now, screen time has app limits and it's, it's very cute. It never works for me. I feel like you can just blow by that. It's a feature, but mm, I don't use it too often. Now, a feature that I wish I knew about sooner is called screen distance, which is under screen time for some reason. It's a really cool feature, and when your phone is way too close to your face, it'll actually stop whatever you're doing, and it will say, hey, you should probably not have your phone two inches away from your face. Move it back, and then you can resume whatever app you're doing. This is great, because it actually prevents me from doing the bad thing, which is, which is this. Now, if you're watching a productivity video and you haven't yet turned on screen time, what, what, are, we, what are we doing? It's so easy to turn on, and once you start tracking your screen time, everything changes. I'm a big fan of the opinion that what isn't tracked can't be improved upon. And if you're not tracking the biggest time suck of your productivity, how can you expect to be more productive? All right, so the next app that we have is Microsoft To Do. And I've been using this bad boy for about four years running 
all the way back when I started teaching myself how to code. It is hands down my favorite to-do list application, and it was a complete game changer when I was learning to code. It's available on Mac OS, iOS, Android, and PC. It's a super lightweight to-do list application, but super powerful, and I typically use this right when I wake up. It's one of the few applications that I have enabled when my phone is in forest mode. It's a to-do list. It's pretty straightforward, but there are these tiny little user experience features that make this just better than any other to-do list I've used. So the first little UX feature that I like is that it syncs with my Mac application seamlessly. I write something on my iPhone, it suddenly pops up on my Mac, and I can keep my information and my to-do synced up. But the best feature of the Microsoft to-do list application is the My Day section. This is a section of the application that refreshes daily, so you get a clean slate every single day on the My Day section. And I try to make sure that the tasks that are on this to-do list are able to be completed with in one day. And then once you do complete it, you get this little satisfying little ding sound effect. It's the best. Now the last feature that I'll talk about that I use daily when I was learning the code is the folder section. It sounds pretty straightforward, but I use this to just completely help me out in my career. Rewind back to about 2020, I was paired with this senior engineer and he would just spit out the most technical jargon talking about some. The SQL query and the load balancer wasn't proportion right and we're gonna have to uh, drop that database. And I had no idea what he was saying. And instead of just feeling dumb, well, I mean, I did feel dumb. But in addition to feeling dumb, I would write down every single thing that he said that I didn't understand. And I would put it in this folder called ask. So at the end of every single workday, I would look at Austin. Austin was a senior engineer, super dope, always shouting out Austin. I would say, yo, what's a class versus a data class? What's a pseudo super user? What's a load balancer? Why do we get pool R? And then Austin would look at me and be like, you're an idiot. No, I'm joking. But he would look at me and he'd give me the answer, of course, because he's awesome. But then I'd write down the answer in this little notes category. And then once I really understood what he told me, I would move this from the ask to the learned and I can go through everything I learned. Fun. Okay, I hope that you're enjoying this video so far because I am a productivity nerd and uh, I just love talking about this kind of stuff. So if you've liked it so far, subscribe. It's free. Okay, I mentioned that your boy has been moving. 15 flights, 60 days, and recently one of those flights was a vacation to Italy. So I flew my brother and his wife out to meet me and my wife in Italy. Doesn't that sound like a fun time? It doesn't sound really great wrong. It was so stressful trying to figure out how to get four people from two different locations to one foreign country at the exact same time. And any time that I have to plan or manage anything, your boys use a notion, every time. And I have been using Notion for about four years now at this point, and Notion is essentially a productivity note-taking application, but it's also so much more than that. And instead of just giving you all the jargon, I'm gonna show you how I have my Notion set up to help me land interviews, manage my content creation, uh, plan trips, and so on and so forth. So when I open my Notion, this is my homepage, this is what I see. Now, I'm not sure if you can tell, but I am a content creator person, and to do that, also, while working a full-time job, it's a lot to manage. So I have this content creation page, and it's a page of many pages. Now, there's a lot going on on this page. There's the content planner, the admin task, brand management, my coding course that I'm working on, editing corner for editing notes and shortcuts that I forget. Without Notion, all of this information would just be jumbled up in my head. So I put all that information on this page right here. The most popular page I use is this page right here, and it's my content planner. And my content planner is set up like a Kanban board. If you're in software development, you've probably heard of that before. And essentially it allows me to just have cards. And every card is a video. And inside of each card, I can have information about the video that is important to the video. So for this, I can have, which area am I talking about? This is, um... I'd say consumer technology. Maybe some, some lifestyle, this is how I live my life. And then after that, we have some notes. This will be fun, there we go. And this video is sponsored by Notion, could you guess? And then I also have the status, and right now I am gonna move this from uh, writing in progress to ready to film. And then outside of that, there's also like a very rich page underneath where I have the titles of this video that I'm working on, the shot list that I need to get. I haven't had any shots done so far. And below that, there's a script of what I'm reading off of right now. Now this view makes a lot of sense to me. I like it, but if you wanted to have a more structured approach to what's going on here, you can always filter how, you viewing, how you're viewing this information and then sort by the status of the video, like that. Pretty easy. Now the folks over at Notion have been busy over the last year. They launched a ton of new stuff like Notion AI, 
Notion Calendar, and as of this month, Notion Sites. Now Notion Sites is amazing because you can basically build and deploy a whole entire website completely in this Notion editor thing. It's amazing. I mentioned I'm a software engineer and I once built my own portfolio website from scratch, pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it, it was rough. It took me so long to manage it and deploy it. And every time I had to change something, that was a whole mess. So I will no longer be building my own websites from scratch. So for me, I think Notion sites would work really great for a link in bio, a resume, or even a media kit if you're a creator. Now I can code, but I am not much of a designer. So anytime that I'm gonna build something like this, I'm definitely gonna check out the templates. On this website building templates page, you can find a bunch of templates and personal websites, resumes, career page, portfolios. I want a link in bio template, so I'm gonna search for that. Um, let's see, this one looks like it's gonna work. So what you can do is click view template. And this is pretty straightforward as a link in bio a website. So what I can do here is just start with this template, add it on over to my notion, and now it's mine. So after I tweak all this links and change this from Sarah to me, I can go ahead into this top right corner and hit publish. So once I hit publish, I get an option to see some customizations. So I can switch it to light mode, dark mode, change the header, turn on Google Analytics, and then I can even change the domain to be something a little bit more crisp. JeremiahPeoples.Notion.Site. Don't steal that, that's mine. And if I go to this bottom left corner, I can click Manage All Sites, and I have this really easy insight into all the sites that I have published or not published. With this, you have the option to either create a new domain or link this page to an existing domain you already have. So if that sounds interesting, try Notion Sites for free. And if you want access to premium features for $12 a month, just try the link in my description. I was listening to a keynote recently, and the keynote speaker said, coding should be treated as a last resort. You're trying to solve problems, and if you have to use code to do that, do it. But if you don't, don't. So in this day and age, like building a website is really honestly just a few clicks away. So with that, thanks so much Notion for sponsoring this video. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> and let's get on with the next productivity apps that we have. So the next application is the newest app in my arsenal of productivity applications. And it has literally saved me weeks of my life back. I'm talking about like actual weeks that I get back of life. The app is called OneSec, and I'm not sure about you, but I mindlessly scroll on my phone in between applications like some type of internet mindless zombie. With OneSec, it makes you think about your phone actions. Whenever you hop over into another app, it'll be like, yo, you were just here, my guy. Do you really need to be back on Instagram? You were here 27 minutes ago. And then that little three second buffer is typically enough to scare me away from using that app that I had no business being on because I just checked it. So I have my screen time buffer set up to about three seconds, which I think is perfect. That's enough time for me to center myself, but you can also customize the time weighted to about 40 seconds, I believe is the upper limit. So that's good sometimes for those super time sucking applications like TikTok. It, you just, you lose a whole day in there. Now, of course, I'm a self-proclaimed nerd and my favorite feature about OneSec is the analytics that you get on the back end. You're able to see how many preventions occurred app open attempts per week, and time saved per application. Now I will admit, I'll be honest with you, that setting this thing up took like so much time and it was super tedious. But on the other hand, the amount of time that I'm getting saved back greatly outweighs the headache that it took for me to set up one sec. Now I've only been using one sec for about two months and already it saved me on average 55 preventions per day which adds up to two hours and 45 minutes saved a day. And over the course of a year, it's estimating that it's gonna save me 9,620 preventions, which is 2.9 weeks of time back. That's amazing. You may think, oh, what are you gonna do with all that time you have back? You're probably gonna go to the beach. You're probably gonna have more time for vacation. And you'd be wrong. I'm spending that extra time in Slack. Now I'm a huge Slack nerd and I wanna get to my laptop to show you everything I got going on in my Slack. So let's go ahead and get there. It's not, it's not here. Okay, now if you haven't heard of Slack, it's this platform or application that you can use to communicate with your coworkers and colleagues and friends all around the world. But why would I need Slack if I have email? Yes, I get it, I hear that. But the problem with email is it's really hard to be collaborative because you send an email and it lands in an email thread. And if you're not on the email thread, then it's really hard to get the information that's inside the email thread. You know, we call that silos of information. But in Slack, you talk in channels, which is kind of like a, a chat room for a project or a specific topic. And the benefit with this is that everyone who is relevant to that project or idea or thought or team 
can have the information at the exact same time. Now, in addition to that, the cherry on the top is that Slack is super easy to use and I love using it. So much so I, I work there. I work at Slack as a senior developer advocate and I use it daily and it's amazing. But I love it so, so much that I'm even talking about Slack outside of work and using it outside of work. So I have a workspace for my content creation thing because now I have a thumbnail designer that creates the thumbnails. I have a video editor, I have a brand manager, and this is a lot of people and we're typically all working on the same thing. So it's a lot easier if we can all talk in the same place instead of five different email chains. Now, a lot of people think of Slack as just another place to talk to your coworkers. And that is a great use case, as I just mentioned, but there's also so much more that you can do with Slack. For example, it's super, super easy to automate your work with Workflow Builder. I buy things for this channel like camera gear, batteries, drones, and come tax season, it has typically been a mess to figure out how much I owe to the government and how much the government owes me. In the US, you gotta handle your own taxes, it's, it's terrible. So to prevent myself from landing in jail, I created a automation or a workflow, and it's super easy. Basically, I collect some information about what I bought, how much it was, what's the thing I bought, some notes about it, and when I bought it. And then with all that information that myself or my brand manager puts in, it sends it to the next step, which is to send all that information to a spreadsheet. And this has been super helpful because I can use it when I'm on my laptop or when I'm on my phone. And at the end of the year, when it comes tax season, I can just give that spreadsheet to my CPA and be like, hey, I did a great job at documenting everything I bought so far. Please don't let the government send me to jail. Side note, all the features that you just saw, you're welcome to try it. My team just launched a developer sandbox, which basically means you get access to a Slack workspace and all the latest features for the free. If you wanna use that, link is in my description. And continuing on with things that I use at work that I also use in my personal life, next up is Google Calendar. Now, I'm not sure if it's just me, but when I have something on my calendar for work, I plan my day around those events. Now, what if, hear me out, you planned your own personal activities and events on a Google Calendar and you respected that time just like you would a work event, right? So when you're at work, it's called scheduling a meeting, but when you do it for your personal life, it's called time blocking. Time blocking is a time management strategy where you block out every single second and every single minute of your day. I used to time block like everything back in the day, but even for myself, I found it was a little bit excessive. These days I'm more relaxed. I have a more relaxed version of this and I call it time blobbing because blobs, you know. With time blobbing, things are a lot more flexible. So you schedule the time, but it's not like a hard requirement. It's just something to put on the calendar so you have a general understanding of where your time can be used throughout the day. The reason I like Google Calendar is because it syncs with my work calendar. And since it syncs with my work calendar, I can tell which portions of the day I have blocked out for meetings. And then I color code the rest of my activities that I have throughout the day. Purple is for my day job meetings. Orange is for YouTube meetings or YouTube tasks. Blue events I share with my wife, so everything that I put as a blue event will automatically show up on her calendar as well so she understands what my day looks like. So my favorite time to time blob is right before bed or right when I wake up, and it just helps me structure-ish my day so I can figure out how to have the most productive day possible. <laughs> So go ahead and give time blobbing a try and let me know if you're gonna use any of the other applications I talked about in this video. If you like this video, you're definitely gonna like that video right there. Otherwise, that's all for this one. I'll see you on the next one. See ya.